Now, when the theory, the polar front theory, evolved in about 100 years ago, um, the researchers were from Norway. They were looking at conditions in Europe and they were noticing and they said outright that this very cold front pushing up a warm front is never going to happen. Um, they were noticing instead uh, temperatures that were going from a cold front, then later cool air, and then after that cool air again. So they hypothesized that there were warm occluded fronts. And we're going to go into that a bit more. Again, it's the same setup of a warm front being chased by a cold front. All right, it's the same cold air being topped by warm air. Cadillac retreating, Volkswagen's going over it, leaving warm air in here in a warm sector, and being chased by a cold front where a Cadillac is just going to throw the warm air in front of it up into the upper levels. But in any case, you've got a warm sector in here. Let's go into how a warm occluded front is different. The warm occluded front is different because the cold air that is coming in is actually not that cold. Let's explain a little bit more. In this case, the cold air that's associated with the warm front is colder than the cool air coming in with the cold front. So think about that. You have here a cold air mass that was topped by a warm air mass because the warm air mass was more aggressive and it could smush the cold air mass down. This created a very stable environment here. You see the stratus clouds on top. You see the lid that has prevented anything from moving up there. A cold front came in as well, but the cold front had air that was not so cold. But it was stable enough so that it could push the warm air mass above it. Remember, we talked about what makes for a stable air mass. It's not just the temperature, but it can also be the windless system that's evolved in it, the amount of uh, stratus clouds, which are indicating fog, and also the steady precipitation rather than fits of precipitation that are more aggressive. So this could have been a really cool, um, stable cool air mass. And in fact, an example of this is frequently seen in the Pacific Northwest where you have cool maritime polar air coming in and that is meeting a and forming a cold front because once you get past these mountains, the Cascades, there's basically no wind in that cool air. So it can be quite stable in forming that cold front. And you have a warm sector here that moved on top of the very cold air, the continental polar air that came down in from Canada. So while I don't love the direction of this arrow. I'd rather see the direction of this arrow move this way coming down from Canada. I'll work with it. Right. In this case, you have a cool front that does not have the power to um, move, a, uh, move a warm front up and to barge in just doesn't have that kind of power. So in other words, 
this cool front, which is actually quite stable right here, is going to piggyback on top of the warm front. This is called a warm occluded front. And in fact, the Europeans who did this research said this is the way it really is. Um, that the cold front will piggyback on top of this stable layer here. When you look at that, you say, where is your occluded front line? The occluded front will always be at the surface. It will always be purple with the half circles and the triangles and so forth. But now it is behind the piggyback. So the piggyback went up and in front and the occluded line came through where the warm air met the cold air at the surface. Warm occluded fronts, the occluded front is behind the piggyback. So if you compare the cold occluded to the warm, the warmer occluded front, you will see that the temperatures are a little different. The cold occluded front will be cold, cool in here, and very cold. So if you're a banjo guy, cold air comes at you and it starts to get a little bit moderate, then really cold air slams you. And we note that in the East Coast because we are often getting that off of the Great Lakes, that occlusion and that cyclone comes down off the Great Lakes. But if you were out in the Pacific Northwest, you would notice cold, a little bit warmer in through here, and then cool air coming in from the coast. It's a different experience. Where, we call it an occluded front, where did that secretive warm sector go? Same place. It went up so that it's not seen at the surface anymore, but that warm sector provides more energy for this front, this secluded front, more convection. You'll get anvil clouds up with it, thunderstorms, thunder snow again. So that doesn't change. The difference between the cold occluded front and the warm occluded front is the area where the occluded front is on the surface. So in the cold occluded fronts, the occluded front is in front of the warm front. And in warm occluded fronts, the occluded front is in back at the piggyback. Let's go over that a little bit more. I hope that helps you. And I already went over that. Here is the um, here are the um, uh, the air masses that are associated with each the warm front and the cold front. Let's go with the warm front first. Again, it's the this is a better drying. It's the continental polar air that's quite cold, the maritime tropical air that's coming up, and then the cool maritime polar air. You can look over this yourself. I'm not going to go over all of this because uh, I'll just bore you to tears, but the occluded fronts you should know have a wide range of precipitation that lasts a long time as the warm front goes through, then the warm sector goes through then the cold front goes through and they're all being heightened as the occlusion happens and they gain strength. Um, this is the Halloween 2011 storm. That was really memorable, right? So a perfect comma cloud in here. I wanted to end with something that everybody will remember. A, cur a perfect comma cloud for this. The warm front is out here, the long cold front and here's your warm sector in here that fueled the top of this storm and that kept the convection going for 10 inches of snow, right? There's the snow right in here. When you see a cyclone, the northwest quadrant will always get the most precipitation. In here, you see how these um, air masses form out to form a cyclone so that you see this coming up pulling to the right with the Coriolis effect. 
you see the maritime polar coming down, pulling to the right, and the continental polar coming down, it pulls to the right a little bit. All of these pull to the right a little bit, then they're pulled in with the centrifugal force, and they form this the counterclockwise cyclone. Same thing out west. So I hope that helps you to understand a bit more, get a feel for this, and how that turns into a counterclockwise cyclone in the northern hemisphere. Remember, it's a clockwise cyclone in the southern hemisphere. See you on the other side.